World Book Day aims to change lives through the love of reading. And in our special edition of the Writer's Corner Live show, we're going to be talking to Hassant Arbader about his book, Hack with the Grenade. It's a collection of editors' backstories of South African news and an interview you certainly don't want to miss because we're going to be covering, well, he covers topics such as race, identity, crime, apartheid, misogyny in business and sport and also spatial planning and more in his book. So don't go away. We will be right back. <laughs> If you're just joining us, then welcome to the Writer's Corner live show. I'm your host, Bridgette Limbanda in Cape Town in South Africa. And the stream is made possible by StreamYard, Creative Edge and BeLive Media. A special warm welcome if you're joining us on Amazon Live so that you can know more about the books that we are we offering and also the author and their backstories. If you're watching us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn, also a very, very warm welcome to you. And just know that we are monitoring the comments, so feel free to say hello. Um, if you have any questions for our author, please post that as well. We are monitoring our comments and will respond. In today's show, we're talking to Hassan Abada about his book, Hack with a Grenade, an editor's backstories of South African news. But first... I want to say a warm welcome to my friend and co-host, Mary Elizabeth Jackson. She is a special needs and disabilities advocate and also the um, award-winning author of the Poolicious Children's Book Series. She writes stories and books for children that um, has special messages for, for them that empowers them. And she also writes motivational books for adults. Mary's in Nashville in the USA and I'm in Cape Town. So let us know where in the world you're joining us from. We'd love to know. And so with that, a warm welcome to my friend and co-host, Mary Elizabeth Jackson. Mary, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. I am very excited to be here. How are you today? I'm very well, can't complain, and I'm very, very excited about um, our guest today. We haven't had yes. many authors from South Africa. I no, just kind of a sprinkle. On one end. Yeah, just like a little yes. sprinkle of them, and we need to feature more authors. We've had authors from South Africa and Ireland and England, and I don't think we we have fans who watch in Australia, but I don't think we've had any authors from Australia. So we would love for people around the globe to reach out to us. We'd love to have you on the show, and uh, we're certainly excited to have him on our show today. Um, and it's so cool to meet someone who is behind the scenes and then writes about it and then is on the other side of things. And so I, I think that's, I always think that's so fascinating. Oh, absolutely. So for those of you who don't know Hassan Abida, he is a journalist who worked in print, radio and television newsrooms in South Africa for a whopping 21 years. He doesn't look and... old enough. <laughs> no, he doesn't. <laughs> He was he was the editor for the well-known Cape Times and Cape Argus, um, and he was also nominated as the Maiden Guardian's 200 Young South Africans in 2013. Hassan also served as the Deputy Chairperson of the South African National Editors Forum, and currently he is the Media and Marketing Communications Manager for the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. But I'm dying to talk to him. Yes. Shall we invite him to the show? Yes, let's do, please.
Hassan, welcome to the show. So great to have you join us today. Hi, Thanks nice so much. to see you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Mary and Brigitte. I'm, I'm actually pinching myself here because <laughs> this is such a, an amazing platform to be featured on and to be speaking to such, um, such a privilege to be hosted by the two of you. Um, I don't know, is it good evening there, Mary, in the, in the, in the States? Home of no, the Smash Burger, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> in Tennessee. Yeah. Actually, actually, we are Smashville. Uh, Nashville is called Smashville. <laughs> yes, you're right. And it is one of the top places in the country for like bridal parties and weddings and music. And uh, it's actually 1037 in the morning here. So oh, okay. we, you are seven hours ahead of me. So I always say that I get to talk to people in the future. That's what I always say, because <laughs> y'all are in the future. So you know what happens before I do, right? <laughs> you can start running when you see trouble on our side. Yeah, if y'all are running, you call me nine one one. Get out! I'm leaving. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, we're my so glad to have you here. Pretty too. We in the same time zone. We, we 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 live quite close to each other, which is quite weird. Um, but yeah, it's it's really an honor to be. A, I love the imaging of your show, by the way. Mm, it's thank fantastic. you. Yeah. She does a fan, she does a fantastic <laughs> job. She's she's like I just call her the live stream guru. That's what that's another name I'm going to give her. Yeah, she's amazing, and and we really enjoy the show. We've been doing it almost three years, and we just love it. Absolutely love it. I know. I still have to pinch myself when I think you know we how we started the show, <laughs> uh, literally, literally on a on a on a whim. You know, we had like one conversation. Let's do it, and then we was like, okay, should we start next week? And yes. here we are, three weeks, three three years, almost three years later. Wow, Crazy, fantastic! Yeah, and, it's yeah we're almost and we're almost booked out till the end of the year. So we, you know, I we saw are, that. Uh, yes, we're excited. I'm very about lucky. That. That's what I'm saying. I'm really lucky and feel very privileged to be here. You know, I come <laughs> from a part of the world in Cape Town, South Africa, where people were dispossessed. People were dispossessed of their homes. So my great my mm -hmm. grandfather was kicked out of his house because. Um, I'm a person of color um, and he couldn't live in a certain area. So we had to move to an area called the Cape Flats, which um, has a lot of social problems. Um, and, and in my storytelling, it, it gave me in, in news in the newspaper world, it gave me a very rich understanding of what what ordinary South Africans go through. You know, the politics that we often hear about in the news are the identity politics. You know, you hear about old Julius Malema, the rabble rouser, our president Cyril Ramaphosa, but on the ground, the issues, the bread and butter issues are what journalists should be concerned about. So this book behind me, um, Hack with a Grenade, is a series of backstories I did while I was editor of the Cape Argus. And as you mentioned in your introduction, it's tackling a whole lot of complex social issues, but using real people that I met on my journey, writing column, writing a column called The Friday Files about interesting South Africans doing incredible things. And I use them to tell the stories, the story of South Africa, really. You know, the psyche behind what makes South Africa tick. A very complex country, lots of inequality, and obviously the book has a big Cape Town bias because that's where I live, but it focuses on national issues as well. Mm. Yeah, because they're is, everywhere, aren't they? They're, all these issues are everywhere. Yeah, sure. But, you know, um, in South Africa, um, I, I, I quoted George Orwell earlier in the week. Um, everybody's, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others, you know, from, mm. from animal farm. And, and the thing is, we, we do have some of the biggest inequality um, ratios between rich and poor in, 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 in a country. And it's a big worry because it's, it's even seen with our vaccine rollout at the moment, you know, mm. that we call it the apartheid vaccine uh, or a vaccine apartheid because... Um, there are just so many different issues. Uh, people aren't plugged into the economy. We've got issues with broadband and access to Wi-Fi. But this story is not, it's not really, this, this book's not really about that. This, this book's a, a celebration of life in South Africa, but it tries to make non-South Africans 
um, or, or those living abroad expats understand what is currently going on in our country. You know, the issues we deal with in newsrooms that we think people know about, but they actually don't, you know? And, and I know that that's highlighted, um, I think it's in chapter two of your book, isn't it? When uh, you, you've actually, you tell the audience what you did in your newsroom to make a point for want of a better um, description. Um, because that's what your book is about. It's about stories of real people. And it's a great way of storytelling because your your stories are relatable to the man on the street. It's stuff we are um, intimately familiar about, you know. So if we read it, you can relate to it, and 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 that's what I love about it. So for those you know who hasn't read the book yet, can you just give us a brief synopsis of chapter two okay. and, and why that's so close to your okay. heart? So so chapter two, if I'm not mistaken, and mm. I haven't read the book myself in a while. I had a lot of reading to do before it was published, but I think it's the one about Danny and the invisible people, if I'm not mistaken, right? Correct. So this was a collaboration, the Cape Argus, the regional, big regional newspaper that I edited um, in 2016. Um, we did a collaboration with homeless people. And, you know, what happened was the guy in chapter three actually introduced me to the guy in chapter two, if that makes any <laughs> sense at all. But anyway, so so I was invited to speak to a group of homeless people in, in, in the Cape Town Central Bus Business District about my job as a newspaper editor. I spoke to them for all of two minutes and then I stopped talking because the stories I, I heard from these homeless people, how they ended up on the streets, qualified doctors, people with degrees, a mom raising her child on the streets of Cape Town. Um, and I actually remember almost running back to the office, which wasn't too far away. I couldn't wait to tell my team, my news team about it. And everybody was kind of like at our news conference, they were like rolling their eyes, you know, like what, what stories are we going to tell about homeless people? You know, how are we going to make this? a newspaper series. And I said, it's very simple. We tell the stories about the people that we ignore every day, the people that knock on our car windows. We don't acknowledge them. We don't look at them. Um, and then we, we came up with a very powerful project called the Dignity Project. And the Dignity Project profiled, it's like, I think, I think there was a series called the, the, the People of New York or the humans no. of New York. Um, the humans of New a, York, yeah. Humans of New York, yeah. And, and in a very similar way, every day for 14 days, we profiled a homeless person in Cape Town. But it was called the Dignity Project for a reason, because I didn't want pictures of homeless people sleeping rough and scratching in bins. So the brief to the photographer who worked on the series was, I want you to take this image of this homeless person at their best. So imagine you're shooting the mayor of Cape Town or the president of South Africa. That's what I want. And a journalist called Lance Whitten, who's a fantastic storyteller, was perfect for the job because he does multimedia as well. So after three weeks, I was begging these guys, show me what you've got. You know, you've, I've given you three weeks, which is a, is a luxury in any daily newsroom. So um, they showed me what they had, and I thought it was a really good series but it missed something. And then I remember Lance telling me he had met a guy who writes and he sent a few pieces into the newspaper. And then I actually had a look at the paper. And yes, it needed some work, but this guy could write, you know. He had a story to tell. And here was a lived experience from the horse's mouth, you know. His name was Danny Oersthuizen. And I invited him in that Sunday before we launched. And I told him, um, you're going to write our front page lead tomorrow. So I think for the first time in publishing history in probably the world, a homeless man wrote the front page lead of a major um, uh, mainstream newspaper. So it was unprecedented. It got a lot of coverage in the media. 
heart started to soften because we gave him a, a weekly column and we paid him for it. He was able to improve his 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 life circumstances. Um, but we learned so much more from Danny about our humanity as well. So you asked me about the experiment. So I had an ulterior motive. How can I send a team of journalists out and they have prejudices about homeless people? Danny happened to be HIV positive as well, and he was gay. So, I mean, think about it. I wanted him to sit next to one of my journalists. I wanted them to feel uncomfortable and to get to know him because, and I invited him into the news conferences because he had a very unique worldview that we take for granted. How do you take a shower when you live on the streets? When a, when a woman is having a period, the public toilets in Cape Town are locked, you know, and the city of Cape Town has actually declared war on homeless people. And a lot of cities all over the world have, has done this. Um, the city started issuing fines for loitering if you're homeless. Can you imagine? So if you don't have a fixed abode, you can't get bail. And we're criminalizing poverty. That's all we're doing. So the so that chapter deals with that. But I don't want to give too much away because I don't want to spoil it for the reader. But I had 200 profiles of this Friday file columns to, to curate as my raw material. And I had to choose 10 stories to tell a coherent kind of book, you know, to put together in a coherent book. Because my idea was to take it to the publisher and say, yeah, publish this. Obviously, they laughed at me and said, it doesn't work like that. We need a narrative. Mm -hmm. We need to hear your voice. And you need to sew this all together in one book, you know? Right, right. So that's the question we have is, who did you write this book for? Because um, on its first appearance, people might think that it's just for a journalist or, you know, if you're going to be a journalism major, it might be a good book to study, things like that. So, um, you know, tell us who this is for. I mean, listening to you, it's for everyone. That's what I hear. But was that your intention in the beginning? And what is, you know, what's your intention now with it? Is it changed? Yeah. So one of the one of my pet hates um, as a journalist was that as journalists we tend to write for each other instead of our audiences. So this was never intended to be a book for journalists. Although if you read the introduction, it does paint the media landscape in South Africa and globally as well. So from that perspective, it's very useful. But what I wanted to illustrate for journalists was there is a life for newspapers after all. If you look at the New York Times, the London Evening Standard, they've all managed to increase their subscription bases through innovative journalism, but also investment in journalism. So the book has messages for owners of media houses, for journalists as well, but primarily it's for the South African public to get behind the scenes of newsrooms, talk about some of the challenges we face, and also to give them a sense of what are the issues that we're not talking about um, through the eyes of a newspaper editor. And often, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. That's the kind of mantra that they put out in the news media. But we're ignoring the real bread and butter issues. And that was my point. So to make newspapers relevant again, we needed to tackle issues that affect real South Africans. It's Yes, there's a lot of crime. And people are beaten over the head with crime all, all the time. But what is the story behind the crime? Who is the criminal? You know? And why is he or she doing what they're doing? You know? And that's why we started the, the kind of phrase in our newsroom, um, in your own voice. And another chapter in the book deals with that when um, you'll remember in 2015 there were massive protests in South Africa by South African students at universities it was calling for free tuition fees must fall that was the hashtag of the campaign so the criticism from the students were that um, they weren't getting their voices heard in the mainstream media it was kind of top heavy we were speaking to the vice chancellors of universities and the minister and all the academics, but we weren't hearing from the students. So somebody put out um, somebody put out an, a, a challenge on Twitter, and without thinking, I accepted the challenge. And the challenge was: it's a guy called um, 
um, Kassalba, he's, uh, he's Twitter royalty in South Africa. And he said, I dare or I challenge any editor to hand over an edition of the newspaper to the students involved in the protest. And I accepted the challenge, not thinking. And then obviously there was the real um, chance that I was going to get fired the next day because I went on Twitter and I publicly proclaimed that we're handing over an edition to students. But it wasn't as easy as it sounded. And it was quite a challenge, but it worked out to be able to have an award-winning edition. It was recognized by the International News and Media Association um, in the Enterprise Journalism category of 2017. So um, it, it was breaking new ground. You know, again, I gave over the trust of a, an entire newspaper to a bunch of students who I didn't know. And they rose to the occasion, you know. So And, and that's how we're going to change newspapers, you know. The relevance, um, that's that's what makes the, the New York Times a fantastic read because, you know, people are, they're investing in, in, in storytelling. And that's and that's what we need to get back to. Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry about We've, my kids. I'm no, sorry about no, my no, kids no. in the background, you know, <laughs> if you can this hear is, them. But live. they're very difficult to handle. <laughs> this okay. is live and this is real. So we've got a question here in the audience from um, Patty Mays, and she says, um, what are two of your most passionate issues? Okay. So I see a lot of people publishing these days. And when I say that, I mean ordinary folks like my mom and dad. They see things on WhatsApp and they forward it without testing whether the information is correct mm -hmm. and whether it's mm -hmm. fake news or not. Or they'll see my mom will see something on Facebook and she'll treat it as a gospel. Like my dad will say, oh, I just read here that people who smoke have more chance of getting COVID. And there's nothing to prove that, you know? And so I started a platform called Loud House Media, and it's there to teach citizen journalists the basic fundamentals of journalism, of content creation, from shooting your own videos, but also the ethics behind it, how not to get sued or have get yourself fired and or even get arrested. We've had cases in South Africa where people um, participated in hate speech um, and used very derogatory terms to describe black people and got arrested and tried in court. So that's what I'm passionate about, you know. Um, about teaching people, but I'm also, because of my new role at the university, I'm very passionate about using my skills that I've learned in newsrooms and turning them into kind of below the line, um, real news, newsworthy items about a university to a mainstream audience and, and using the full 360 degrees of TV, um, video, audio, print, online, digital, social media, all the tools to tell a story about an amazing university that I, that I work for, you know? In fact, I'm wearing oh. the blazer, by the way. I'm like... I see. Off. <laughs> university of the Western Cape, yeah. I see. Wearing that, wearing <laughs> that proud. Hassan, just yeah. before we end off, um, do you have... I mean, you've done a, an amazing job of hack with a grenade could you share one or two uh tips or strategies for our aspiring authors when it comes to crafting yeah. a com compelling story yeah so this book started 10 years ago actually i'm a little bit embarrassed to say that piers morgan inspired me to write this book <laughs> um about 10 years ago he wrote a book called The Insider. <laughs> he, yeah. he wrote a book called The Insider, and it was all about his time at the Daily Mirror when he was doing some amazing advocacy journalism. You know, he was against the war in, in Iraq, and he kept a very meticulous diary, but I didn't do the same thing over my years as an editor. I was part of the first team in South Africa that, that started a tabloid or as what's known as a red-top newspaper, you know? a naughty newspaper with scandal and 
uh, page three girl and what you have was all all about it. So the the, the story started. Um, the, the the manuscript was called Hack. Um, sorry, um, Tabloid Junkie, and it was going to be the introduction of the of um, tabloid news newspapers to South Africa. But then, as I grew up and I got and I have kids now, and as I graduated to the more formal unpopular newspapers, <laughs> if I can call it that, mm -hmm. um, the story changed, you know, and I actually lost the manuscript because my MacBook bombed and I was able to retrieve it. And that then said to me, I need to start writing the story now. So my advice to everybody who's got a story to tell, an aspiring author, don't delay, you know, don't say one day I'm going to write the story. Say today's day one. I'm going to mind map all the chapters and I'm going to put it together I also want to, one of the very useful things for me was carrying my phone with me and using my voice recorder because suddenly a turn of phrase will occur to me and you know when you get back home, it won't sound the same when you're trying to type it and remember it in your head. So I re I'm recording voice notes with myself all the time. And because I write a weekly column, I also do this. So people see me in traffic talking to my phone I suppose it's not that strange anymore because the, Kardashi no. <laughs> the Kardashians do it all the time, you know. But but I'm busy recording voice notes and turns of phrases and ideas. And it's a very, very useful tool because the best way of writing is the spoken word. We need to write the way we speak because we're relating stories. And my passion really is storytelling, whether you do it on video or on social media or in a book or in a newspaper, you know, and, and the best way to tell a story is think to think about your mom and how are you going to relate something that happened today? You're going to speak the way you speak, not write a passive sentence, you know. So so use your voice recorder on your phone. That's my big tip I want to leave you with. with um, I absolutely on today's agree. Show. I, yes, that's exactly what I do too because like you said, it never comes back the same way. Even if it's three o'clock in the morning and you need to go back to sleep, you got to write it down or voice record it because it never sounds the same. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, but, where can but at three o'clock in the morning, um, yeah. my wife's also complaining. Um, sure. Oh, she's snoring. She's <laughs> snoring. So you have to live with that as well. <laughs> well, we won't Hassan, tell you said that, but. Uh, <laughs> absolutely you not. Hassan, thank you so much. This was amazing. And I think we're yeah. going to have to invite you uh, back again. I think we could probably go for an hour with you just, absolutely. you know, very, very easily. So we'll find us. We'll find a way somehow to um, to get you back on the show. But I want to say a huge big thank you to everyone who's joined us on Amazon Live today. Um, thank you to Patty. We loved all your comments um, uh, on Facebook. Thank you to everyone on, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. It was Twitter. great having you join us. Um, so thanks, everyone. Hassan, thank you so much. We look forward to Cheers. having you back as a guest again. It was a real pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.